Hello. I was just going through my mail for today and I found out that Westar is planning on cutting off our electricity to the house tomorrow for up to eight hours. And I'm like, holy smokes, but there's no other place I can go until I get my COVID test back. <sighs> so anywho, this is my best attempt at getting you the information and keeping progressing on to our classes, our class information. Um, so today we're talking about in core skills, we're talking about ADA accommodations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over the PowerPoint and then, um, and it's a real short PowerPoint, so it shouldn't take that long. And then I'll go over the assignment that I've always tied to this module because it's really fun. And then um, I'll share with you on Canvas the Jeopardy game that we play that kind of helps us memorize some of the facts and figures with the ADA and this section and stuff like that. So, um, and then you can play that at your leisure to help you prepare for tests and other to kind of get that information into your world, into your, your knowledge bank. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I don't think I have any videos, but just in case I will make sure we have optimized. So environmental adaptations. So what we're talking about mainly is our environment in this module. So one's environment is a major component of living well and being able to take care for oneself. This fact that is so logical that its significance is often overlooked. So true. Our environment can set us free or it can really uh, limit us into our potential. And um, hopefully that's where we come in as OT pr practitioners to be able to help um, people not be limited by their environment. So in the past, the ADA, the American Disabilities Act, <clears throat> this is kind of how it all came into being. So we're all familiar with the ADA or we're all have heard about the ADA and stuff. Um, I'm under that assumption. But um, this is how it kind of came about. So after World War II, only 2% of the spinal cord, excuse me, World War I, only 2% of the spinal cord injured patients or uh, victims survived. So very low numbers, not very many people in, the, in our communities that were uh, continuing their, um, their life with a spinal cord injury. So after World War II, so this would have been the 40s, 40s, early 50s, not 45, I guess that's when I got over, sorry. 85% um, of spinal cord injured patients survived. What a big difference from 2% to 85%. Big, big difference. <clears throat> so what this, did, what this did was prompt major legislation to care for the veterans. And um, from that, we've had several uh, pieces of legislation that have come for for ADA or American Disabilities Act. In addition to that, what also happened in the 50s, the early 50s, was the polio epidemic. <clears throat> so if you remember, the polio, uh, so polio, when it affects people, it paralyzes you. It paralyzes your muscles. And um, so we didn't have ventilators back then. We had iron lungs. So people had to be put in these huge iron lungs to be able to breathe and to be able to sustain life during the life cycle of that virus. So that happened in the 1950s. <clears throat> Along came um, ANSI in 1961. So that was pretty much just, it was everybody, a lot of people got together, architects, you know, um, design people, construction worker, not workers necessarily, but construction leaders and stuff like that. Um, they got together and published accessibility standards. It was, um, so these standards were then put out to the community and to the nation. And it was uh, voluntarily to be followed. They encouraged people to follow them. It was voluntary. And as we all know, usually if something, it doesn't have any teeth behind something, you know, there's no ramifications, it's usually ignored. So, and that's 
kind of what happened with ANSI in 1961. So in 1968 came the Architectural Barriers Act. So where they decided to put some teeth behind these ANSI uh, standards, accessibility standards, meaning that if you receive federal funds to build a, a, a structure, then the buildings had to be accessible from that point forward. Now this did not cover private, um, private buildings, private homes, or anything like that, but for anything that you receive federal funds, it had to be uh, accessible. <clears throat> so at that time, the public attitude began to shift. Um, disability rights movement happened, um, and people became more aware of people with disabilities and the value and the contribution to society that they played. And so there came a Rehabilitation Act in 1973 that happened. And then in 1975 was Education for All Handicapped Children. So believe it or not, up until that point, people, uh, kids who were severely handicapped did not necessarily have to be educated by the public school system. I know it's hard for us to believe, right? So that was the PL 94142. Since that, it's been replaced by other one other laws and stuff, the ID, IDEA. Mm -hmm. Teresa will tell you more about that. So. so the American Disabilities Act was finally passed in 1990. Whew. Okay, let me go back. 1968, Architectural Barriers Act, 1990 was the American Disabilities Act. So you can tell that we think we're in a quagmire now, a political, <laughs> political actions where we can't get anything done. Um, I think it's, we have a historical perspective on it. <laughs> historical precedent. So what is the intent of the American Disabilities Act? Well, it was to extend the civil rights protection that was given to people with, um, civil rights protection that was given to people of different races and ethnic minorities. It was to extend that to people with disabilities. It was designed to prohibit discrimination in employment, state and local government services, public transportation, telecommunications, and public accommodations. So, and it also fostered public awareness that people with disabilities are viable, contributing members of society. Who does it cover? Well, any person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, self-care, walking, speaking, breathing, learning, working, and performance of manual skills are major life activities according to the ADA. So, and wouldn't we have to agree as OT professionals? I think so. So uh, this has been a while, but <clears throat> um, most recent, not necessarily most recently, but this is our recent number that I have in here is that 49 million persons of all ages are covered under the ADA Act. So that's a lot. We have 300 million people, 350 million people, 300 I think million people here in the United States, so 50 million people would, el would be potentially eligible for uh, ADA accommodations. So. so with 20, oh, sorry. Hold please. Let me put that on vibrate. With an estimated, uh, with 25% in full-time employment. So there's five components to the ADA uh, law. So I do not expect you to memorize all these different components, but just know that there's five. It's a big law. Um, there's the section that covers employment. There's the section that covers uh, public service. There's public accommodations, telecommunications, which of course has been totally blown out of the water with cell phones. Um, but remember 1990, we did not have cell phones. <laughs> we had kind of two-way radios. <laughs> so, and then miscellaneous provisions. So universal design. So that's the ADA. So the ADA Act, um, just as a brief cover, okay. So the ADA Act, the thing about the ADA Act is that it does not mean that a, uh, a company or somebody has to uh, come in and put in an elevator into a building or something like that. What it means is you, if you're, um, you have to make 
reasonable accommodations for people for accessibility. So for example, say a person has recently injured and uh, they want to return to work, say maybe now they're wheelchair dependent and their office is on the second floor. So you don't have to build an elevator to get that person to the second floor to their office. A reasonable accommodation would be to move their office down to the first floor. So that's, I think that's a good example for uh, ADA accommodations. Um, so it can be, you know, simple, like maybe lowering the water fountains so that uh, people can reach, all people can reach them, those types of things. But it does not necessarily, it, it's reasonable accommodations. So I don't think their purpose is to put any, any um, company out of business in trying to accommodate all the different scenarios that people would have with disabilities. Now, unfortunately, I've heard of um, illegal uh, components that um, will come into a private uh, private company they'll ask to use the bathroom like they go into a store or something like that they'll ask to use the restroom and if there's anything they can document in there that is not ADA compliant then uh, they'll sue so they go across the nation for example I heard this one person had 10 lawsuits against 10 different companies at one time that's all they do just go across the nation and you know look for bathrooms for mom and pop stores, small areas and stuff like that. So small companies and even the bigger companies too, but the bigger companies have a deeper well of lawyers and legal departments to protect themselves from that. But So that's really, that's a terrible miscarriage of justice for that law. That's not the intent at all. The intent is to make it accessible so for people. So there's, there's another thing that's kind of come into being in the last 20 years it's called universal design. And um, so this principle is where as engineers, oh my gosh, we got to love our engineers because they've made life so much better in our world. I mean, it just, it, it would just be horrible without engineers. I mean, we'd be back in the stone ages if we didn't have people creating tools and ways to do things and lifts and, cranes and all sorts of stuff but um you know just faster better easier ways of doing things or even being able to accomplish them and stuff so so anyway uh universal design is a concept taught to engineers and uh architects and engineers so this with the feeling that um the accessibility needs to be free and normal movement throughout the environmental setting so we don't need we don't want to make it like everything for the person in the wheelchair is set off to the side. We want it to be like in a restaurant, you want it to be flowing just the same as the people who are ambulatory through the environment. Um, accessibility, minimize obstacles. So maybe just moving, as you guys have completed your wheelchair experiences on campus, maybe just moving that uh, electric, the door opener, switch from one side I always hear from Dugan Library the switch while it's an electric door opener which is great it's the switch is on the wrong side so it's difficult to get it hit and then get back over out of the way of the door by the time it opens and stuff like that so just simple things like that so universal design also provides adequate clearly defined cues for users with specific disabilities for example if say um, I mean, a lot of times they'll use the symbols for men and women's restrooms, you know, with the men, with the uh, stick ladies having the skirt and stuff. So that's simple, defined, clearly defined cues for users. So uh, we want to move towards uh, the separation of special needs and mainly make these adaptations available for anybody. So, uh, for example, the cutout curbs. That's great for, you know, it was originally designed for people for wheelchairs, but oh my gosh, how, how much do we love it when we're biking down on the river path or how much do we love it when we're pushing a stroller with our triplets or something like that. So, um, you know, putting our garbage cans on wheels instead of having to carry them out to that curb or something like that. I mean, what a simple thing, but that's universally used by all of society, not necessarily just to people who are, uh, by people who are um, 
disabled. So the seven principles, you'll want to be fairly familiar with them. Stuff so equitable use, handicap and non-handicap can use it, flexibility in use, simple and intuitive, as we mentioned, perceptible information. So um, even if it may be a little confusing to begin with, people can figure it out. So we might be seeing a lot of that with our computers. I'm like, oh, just give me that, just, you know, make it so that I just have to click this and that and then I'm happy stuff. So uh, build in a tolerance of, for error with uh, the devices too, so that, you know, people who aren't familiar with how to use it won't actually mess it up stuff or they'll actually be able to use it successfully even though it's not exactly how it's supposed to be used. Um, low physical effort so, and that really depends upon your age and your um, physiological status and then size and space approach and use so keeping all those things in mind um, about the universal design. Have I posted this ways of living chapter? Hmm. I'm gonna Okay, I'm gonna make a note. Ways of living chapter. Note to self. <clears throat> so from uh, universal design came another concept um, in 2003. So that nobody should be barred from visiting due to um, accessibility. So pretty much focused on being able to visit our friends and family's homes. You know, if our parents are, have now become wheelchair dependent, you know, if our, is our home so old that they can't get through the doorway? Or do we have too many steps? Or can they even get into the bathroom? So uh, architects and engineers and construction people, uh, decided to have these principles of visitability. So um, new home construction hopefully will be designed with one step free entrance, hallways that are three feet wide, 36 inches, one bathroom with a 32 inch door. So that's the best width for the bathroom to get through with your wheelchair. But also not necessarily just only with the bathroom, but making sure the hallway is large enough that they can turn. So with your, um, with these numbers, the 36 inches wide in the bathroom, you're going to want to also become familiar as OT practitioners. What's the standard width for a door? What, what, um, how many inches do you need to actually get through a door? So if you're, how high should a toilet uh, be? How high should the toilet seat be for a person to get in there? And so in our packet, I don't have it with me, obviously, but um, there's these really detailed looking little engineering type drawings. So you really want to focus on like how high your countertop should be. How high should a table be? How high, you know, like I said, how wide should a door be? How high should a toilet seat be? Those types of general uh, basic concepts so that when you go in and do a home evaluation, you can recall those from memory. So environmental modification, modifications, being an OT practitioner is more than being a clinician. It's about scanning your environment and determining how your present skills combined with clinical knowledge can meet the needs of a population. That is so true. There's that creativity mixed with clinical reasoning and to give our patients the best outcomes. So there's a lot of different sources for environmental modifications. <clears throat> So there's a lot on the web, there's a lot in your books uh, that you've been uh, using in the OTA program. A lot of organizations have created their own checklists. So for example, uh, there's some examples in the handout, in the packet, and also in the early book. There's CASPER, you do the assessment, send it to, into the developer and the recommendations are prepared. Uh, AARP has a rate your home checklist for home design. So, so there's a lot of tools out there. Now you may be saying, why do I need all these tools? Well, because as OTs and OTAs, 
a lot of times we'll go out and do home evaluations for people before they're released from the hospital or rehabilitation facility or skilled nursing facility. So the OT, uh, maybe the PT, uh, the patient will go out and, or the family if the patient can't come, we'll go out and we'll measure doorways. We'll see how many steps they have. We'll how long would the ramp need to be? Um, are they gonna be able to reach their refrigerator? Where's their washer and dryer located at? Where does that need to, how, what kind of changes need to be made for them to be able to do their laundry? And um, how high is their bed to get into? Can they get into their bathroom? All those kind of questions. So it's very, very common for us to go out and do a home modification, not home modifications, but home assessment so that uh, the families can make modifications as needed. And so those checklists come in very handy because there's a lot of things to consider and look at when you're out and when you're out looking at homes. How thick is the carpet? You know, um, do they have throw rugs? Here I'm back on that little checklist. Do they have throw rugs that then might be a tripping hazard? Can they reach the light switches? You know, what's, you know, how hot is their hot water? Peter, how hot are they keeping it? Is that a danger? Can they open and use their oven? Are the controls on the stove on the front side instead of the back side, back, side, back panel for security and uh, safety? So we might be going out and doing these assessments for our patients. So, um, so say you've done that, you've completed that, and now you know, you're looking at a lot of money to remodel a house. And so there might be some funding issues for people. More, like, more than likely there are funding issues for people. So there's different funding avenues. Um, obviously people can use their own resources, maybe their 401k, um, you know, their savings, their investments and stuff like that if they have those available. If not, they may be able to get housing or community grants. There might be funds from organizations. My goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> there might be funds from organizations such as like Shriners, um, the Masons, the Kiwanis, the Lions Club, all sorts of organizations, civic organizations as well, as, as an example. Uh oh, we are not available now. I, th I think this did that yesterday too. <laughs> Ridiculous, huh? Okay, uh, Voc Rehab and Independent Living Centers. There's two uh, medical loan clauses here in Wichita, but um, the one that's over here on 2nd Street, just right north of Newman, is actually connected to an independent living center that's designed to um, help people uh, modify their home and live independently as long as possible. They may be able to get funds from Workman's Comp. Um, other civic groups mentioned here, actually, so the, Funds from organizations, a lot of times the money comes from the organizations, but not necessarily, and then you hire a person to do the work. But these civic groups, Mennonite Housing, Habitat for Humanity, actually do come out and build the ramps. So, so it's really, it's pretty cool, the things that they do. Um, Habitat for Humanity, I'm not sure if they do modification, but Mennonite Housing used to do lots of, men, um, lots of modifications. So for example, I had a home health person and um, she was, she was a bilateral, no, she was just a, she was, she was just a unilateral lower extremity amputee, but um, her home, it was like on market and Broadway close to that area. And um, she had steps in the front and then the back steps, were very her back uh, deck and steps down were very rickety and loose and kind of dangerous so it was really hard for her to go up and down them and dangerous for her to do that so I remember as <clears throat> we worked with her in OT and PT the um, we were able to make the connections with the social worker and um, the case manager and to get um, a new back deck built with a ramp that allowed her to safely get in and out of her house. Even though she wasn't totally wheelchair dependent, I mean, she was an amputee, lower extremity amputee, but that was, that her environment was limiting her ability to engage in the community. So that was a, that was a good outcome on that experience. 
uh, private loans uh, if people don't have uh, their own resources available. Now you may be thinking, oh my gosh, that's a lot of money to, that's, you know, two, three thousand dollars to modify my bathroom or, you know, a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars to build a ramp. But if we have, if we compare that to seven thousand dollars a month in a nursing home, you can sometimes when people see that and they have that comparison, they can see maybe the value of being able to stay in their home longer, not just for the emotional benefit of it, but also for um, just to help guard their, their uh, resources as much as possible. Okay, so whenever you do go out and do a home evaluation, you have to work with the family and the caregiver. So make sure it is client focused. You can't go in and make all these recommendations and them saying, no, we're not interested in it. We don't have the money. They don't even go in that room anyway. Why are you worried about that? You know, so definitely, definitely make it very client focused. Those communication skills are critical in that situation. Um, definitely assess the needs of the caregiver as well. So because um, it's, you know, like as we wrote, as we loaded that wheelchair into the car, it's, it's, makes an impact when you have a 70 year old caregiver to their spouse trying to load up equipment, maybe if they're trying to help them bathe, um, those types of situations. So, so we have to really include the assess the need of the caregivers as well. So, and then a design that can grow and change with the needs of the client, if at all possible. Um, sometimes people have built homes that are totally 100% accessible with lower countertops, lower cupboards, but that may not uh, do well on the resale value of their home. So they definitely want to take that into consideration um, before they make any big changes. So um, in addition to home evaluations and ADA accommodations, I thought this was very interesting and actually some proof showing that we are and not just Facebook proof. I'll show you the article here in a minute and stuff. So this came over, this came out about a year ago, I believe, maybe a year and a half, that uh, the CDC identified occupational therapy, home modifications, sorry, this is cut off, home modifications as the number one way to reduce cost with falls. Occupational therapy, nobody else, no nursing, no PT, home mod o OTs stuff. So that is sweet now to get the word out. That's the important thing. So here's the article that they referenced. Oh, I think I already have this open. Let me get to it. So here is the report, actually not the article, that they referenced in that Facebook post. I think that was like on from North Carolina's NBC, uh, North Carolina's OT Association page. So anyway, the CDC Compendium, compendium of Effective Fall intervention, Interventions. Okay, so what works? So yeah, they talk about exercise, uh, you know, this multi-pronged approach, but uh, there's a whole section in here for home modification and home visits for uh, occupational therapy. So I'm just going to try to get to that. So home visits by an OT. I know this is a little dated, but I'm it's glad that they recognized it and include that. Okay, fall rates were reduced by one third about, um, among men and women. So by um, having an OT visit them in their home, identified environmental hazards and unsafe behaviors, and recommended home modification and behavior changes. So they identified environmental hazards such as slippery floors, poor lighting, rugs with curl up edges, and those types of situations too. Uh, behaviors, also they identified wearing loose shoes, leaving clutter, using furniture. Now, is this an actual home modification? Not necessarily, but um, it's important that, that we understand that this is also part of the home ADA, home ADA accommodation assessment service that we provide. So, 
So using, here's key elements from this study, using an experienced OT is critical, okay? Um, and this. So there's another study that says, only when an OT does this or an OTA does this, home assessment is it effective. Not when a CNA, a home health aide does it or anything like that, is it effective? And that is problematic because of PD, PG, PDGM that came into being in January, um, where we have other professions that are assessing people's showering skills and stuff like that. So ugh, we gotta make sure that as practitioners, we get this information to our bosses and say, just because an aide looked at them, they're not safe. You know, they're not safe in doing this. So it needs to be us. Another home intervention training with an OT and other, I think this one was a team and stuff. So here we go. Um, the Pig Hill study, 2011. The intervention was only effective when it was implemented by OTs. And that fall rate reduced 46% when it was done by OTs. Let's see where, where did it say? So the study showed compared by either an OT or a home care worker, okay? So, but, and here's a summary down here too, as we mentioned, only when it's done by an OT is it effective. anyway that's a resource for you to show your um your bosses when you're out working so let me get back to this other article and i think i have that So this was talking. This article is talking about the federal legislation that has been um, working its way through Congress about falls prevention. Okay? So it was a bipartisan effect. Thank goodness um, on falls prevention, and we can see here this is 2019, approximately 50 billion dollars annually in fall-related injuries, and that's expected to double by 2030. 2030 is only 10 years away, nine years away now, 100 billion. So, and 75% of these costs were borne by Medicare and Medicaid programs. So if they can get an effective call of effective fall prevention program in, it definitely pays back. So this is a situation where it really pays to be preventative. So, so, so I was looking in here um, effective use screening and therapies. I don't know if it says in here specifically. Oh, here it is. Okay. The Home Health Payment Innovation Act. Home health, especially occupational therapy, is another prevention tool. This was our one of our legislative leaders in Washington noting that uh, Medicare Advantage has started to expand this benefit. Whoop, whoop. So it's not very often we get called out, so that's exciting. So, okay, so there we go. That's an introduction to ADA. Um, so the important thing is to know key bits of knowledge about ADA, to know general screening um, measurements for wheelchairs, in a home. And then the third thing we're gonna do, and then I'll post that um, Jeopardy game for you guys to play as a study aid. And then the third thing we're gonna do is this. Mm -hmm. If I can find it. I thought I had them open. No, I don't want that one. There we go. So the third thing we're gonna do is this. I want you to actually put this into action. 
So like I said, we go out and we do home assessments routinely as part of our practice. And, you know, but it doesn't have to be limited to the home. So let's think about our parks for our people of all ages that go and play on these parks. So what I've done in the past is during lab time, we've paired up into groups of three typically that would go out to a park stuff, but uh, we'll just do them individually this year. So choose a park to go to. Here's three in Wichita that we have typically gone to, but you can choose one if you don't live in Wichita, you can choose a park um, in your hometown. We would be more than happy to learn about that as well. You're gonna go and as you look at this park, answer these questions. Is it accessible? Are the wheelchair, are the picnic tables accessible? Are they, do they have protection from the sun? Are the bathrooms accessible? I don't necessarily need you to go in and measure toilet height and stuff like that because some of them can be pretty gringy, but if you want to take a quick look inside stuff, you can do a quick assessment. If you brought a wheelchair dependent person to this park, or it says child, but person, would they be able, what kind of activities would they want to, would they be able to participate in? So if you brought a person with a uh, lost strand crutches, and so those lost strand crutches are the short crutches, and then they have that cuff that goes around their forearm. So you've probably seen them on TV. So um, usually like um, people with uh, cerebral palsy and stuff like that use them. They're not commonly used anymore, but if they are. So what kind of activities can they participate in at that park? So take your critical, your clinical reasoning and your critical eye uh, to these parks and just assess them, see what you might recommend. So come back and show us like a pictures or a little video if you wanna put it together about what you would recommend for improving that park, if anything at all. Um, so that's part one. And then part two is I want you to take a look at your own house where you're living now. Um, so if you need to, you can put this scenario in your mind, bringing a 16 year old daughter home, um, with a recent C5, C6, but some of the area, some of the questions that you, is it accessible? Is it inaccessible? What's limiting their performance? So, and we'll just have you briefly tell us a little bit about, um, the accessibility of your current home in lab next week. So we'll, we'll have you share the park and your home information next week in lab. So, anyway, so be prepared to where you can access your pictures or videos if you want to share those with us and stuff. So go forth, have fun, be creative, and we'll love to see your information uh, next week. So I'll make sure I get this posted up as well. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, that'll do it for core skills this week in the lab portion and on ADA home modifications. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys next week. So, okay. Talk to you later. Bye.